And so the question is, and I want you just to literally turn to your neighbor and tell them a number. I'm not going to ask you to shout it out. How many of the companies on that Fortune 500 list from 2020 did not exist in any form in 1995? I literally just want you to share a number, a guess, a private number with you and your neighbor. Just take 10 seconds to do that. I just want you to make a commitment here. That's it. That's your 10 seconds. Enough. I know we could spend 10 minutes on this. So why do I want you to do that? Because when I tell you the answer and you haven't committed to a number, you're likely to say, well, that's obvious. But it's not obvious. The true answer is 17. And most of you, I've done this exercise so many times that I can predict the median answer in the room was probably somewhere in the 150 to 200 category. That's the usual sort of guess I get. This surprises literally everybody. And if you're interested, on the right-hand side, you've just got a little bit of a breakdown of the 500. Because there's only 200 or so which have been around forever. And there's a bunch of spin-out companies which don't count because they're spun out of big companies. They're new, but they're actually old companies which look new. And you've got this huge jump bunch, the orange ones in the middle there, which have been kind of gradually growing, and they've been promoted into the Fortune 500, but they're not that young. Many of them are 40, 50, 60 years old. You've only got literally 17 companies, like Tesla, like Facebook, like Amazon, that have been created since 1995. The other 483 have transformed themselves. So if, if we're just going to finish the animal metaphor off, the the big companies are not dinosaurs. For the most part, they are elephants who have learned how to dance. There was a famous old book by Lou Gerson of IBM who says elephants can't dance. And so I'm playing on that. In other words, this is really good news. Many of you, I'm going to guess most of you, work in established companies, big companies. You're worried about the future. And I'm suggesting that actually the future is an awful lot brighter than you realize. You are more resilient than the newspapers would have you believe. And there are things that you are doing and can do to stay relevant. So that's the, that's the kind of the overall arching message that I've got. How is it that these companies are adapting? There's two parts of the story, and we're only going to talk about one part today. The first part of the story, which we're not going to discuss, is the specific types of changes these companies make in terms of moving into new business areas, in terms of creating little skunk work operations to pilot new ventures, which become new businesses that ultimately allow the company to, to tap into the new technologies. There's lots of things out there in terms of what they do. My talk today is much more on the second part, which is how they function. In other words, the internal processes and activities, and indeed ways of working, all of which comes back to people issues, that have allowed them to continue to adapt in ways, as I say, that they don't often get the credit for. There was a gentleman by the name of Mondeman, Hans Mondeman. It's possible some of you have come across him. He was a road traffic engineer from Ireland, um, and he had the bright idea that, in fact, we have over-engineered our traffic systems in big cities in Western Europe, and that the smart thing to do would actually be to simplify them. And so he persuaded a few towns. This is Drachten in the northern part of the Netherlands. He persuaded them to rip out their traffic lights and their roundabouts and just to create this shared space. He literally called it the shared space model, whereby the cars and the cyclists and the pedestrians could coexist. And of course, no big surprise, within a few weeks, people had figured out how to build that sort of you know, adaptive behavior so that they could all coexist, find their way through, through the intersection without hitting anybody. There were no additional accidents. It wasn't a case that this actually led to more accidents. And people generally enjoyed the experience, shall we say. They appreciated the freedom that it was giving them. I think you see where this metaphor fits within the world of organizations. We, you know, human resource teams, strategy teams, um, budgeting teams, finance teams. We love to create order. We love to create systems which ensure that everybody kind of does their job. And there's nothing wrong with that. Order, to some degree, is useful. But as I said, we should be matching complexity with simplicity. We should be doing what we can, actually, to take away some of those systems and processes where possible, within boundaries. Ad hocracy is privileging action ahead of knowledge and position. 
in its simplest form, adocracy simply says that when we aren't sure what the right way forward is, the best thing we can do is to do something. We can literally try something out, create a pilot or an experiment, talk to a customer, try to figure out the way forward, not by debating, not by just falling back on rules and procedures, but by actually doing something a little bit different. Adhocracy says within that structure, we are trying to inculcate in people this mindset of action first. Structure comes second, action comes first. Slide number one, I did a little survey last year, uh, two years ago rather, um, asking people about what they thought leaders needed to be good at in tomorrow's world, in the, t t the digital world of tomorrow. And of course they talked about purpose and sense of direction. Of course they talked about being decisive under conditions of uncertainty. But number three, getting rid of obstacles. This is for me is a, is a huge part of our job as leaders. Or let me just put it in terms of my framework. If you look at the three different models of organizing, and if you look about what the kind of the overall overarching objective of each of those is, and then you say to yourself, what is the job of the leader in those? I think you come to a very simple conclusion. Yes, you can be a, a traditional, if you like, command and control leader in a bureaucratic world. But if you are trying to get the best out of your people, if you're trying to keep the organization, as I say, fit for the future, able to adapt in the ways that we need it to, our job as leaders and our job as HR leaders trying to build the next generation of leaders in our organizations is to really build that skill set around experimentation, direction setting, and encouragement and enablement. So with that, I will finish. Thank you very much.